All right, so, so this brings us to the work of um, Andrei Komogorov. Komogorov was a mathematician, uh, he lived in Russia, and um, he had a lot of contributions in uh, math and uh, science, but uh, what's important for us is uh, his contributions in, uh, in the turbulence uh, um, uh, field. So, um, if you look up uh, in particular in uh, mathematics, uh, there are a lot of um, uh, rules and laws that have been uh, the, named after him. And um, uh, he was born in 1903, so he was living this century, and most of his contributions were done in, uh, in, uh, in the 40s and 50s when he was working on it. All right, uh, so what was his work in turbulence? And so, come on off. Um, so essentially, he said um, uh, the large-scale turbulence is uh, determined by the boundary conditions. So, for example, you have a jet, a step, um, mixing layer. So the, the scales of the, um, that uh, that uh, boundary condition of that um, that test case is going to determine how the large-scale vortices are written. All right. So large-scale turbulence. Uh, determined by the boundary conditions. Um, for example, a jet that produces ring vortices, a mixing layer that produces uh, the uh, Rollers, step, etc. And uh, is inhomogeneous. So, uh, for example, a ring vortex, uh, if you blow smoke from, yeah, if you have smoke kind, you blow a ring vortex uh, out of the mouth. You're going to see it's very inhomogeneous. That means um, it's determined by the by the ring of this uh, this vortex. All right, um, but uh, once these uh, large scale structures are starting to break up into smaller ones, the um, the small scale turbulence is a bit more more uh, becomes more homogeneous. It becomes more attainable. So it becomes more general. So and he says that towards the smaller scales, the inhomogeneity is lost. And the turbulence becomes more universal. All right. So, and uh, that leads uh, to his first hypothesis. Uh, Komogorov hypothesis on local isentropy. All right, so it essentially says it's sufficiently high Reynolds numbers, uh, are you not? So the Reynolds number based on the, um, the, uh, the, the size of the um, um, large scales, the small scale turbulence becomes statistically isotropic. That means for high Reynolds number flow essentially means that well, whenever the turbulence is, uh, we have a turbulent flow that is um, uh, sufficiently high. So somewhere boundary, uh, remember, for example, uh, a pipe flow becomes, uh, is lamina b below a Reynolds number of 2,100 and uh, above uh, 3, 4,000 it becomes turbulent. So for the um, borderline cases you would not uh, find, uh, or this one would not be valid, but uh, let's say once the, the flow becomes fully turbulent, then the, the, uh, this hypothesis should be working. All right, so that is his hypothesis. And um, with that, um, we can start to work a little bit more on the isentropic part. 
So the anisotropic part we need to uh, somewhat handle on a case-by-case -case basis. That means, uh, for example, you have a jet, you need to handle the wing vortices. If you have a mixing layer, you need to handle the rollers. But uh, if you start to, um, but for, for all of these cases, the, the small scale turbulence is becoming more universal. That means the small scale turbulence that you find in a turbulent jet is identical to the small scale turbulence in a, in a mixing layer or the small scale turbulence in a boundary layer. And with that, we can start to well, look at it and uh, see how we can derive some expressions on it. Okay. So first, uh, I need to set up a limit, a limit for my anisotropy. And I call that LEI. Or I call it LEI, you will see a little, little bit later. But um, so I say all turbulent scales below that threshold are going to be uh, homogeneous. Everything above that is uh, more inhomogeneous. And just for an example, I can say that, for example, LEI is one sixth of L. So that's just an example. It's not uh, uh, so far. We haven't got a lot. But uh, if you look, for example, at our mixing layer over here, you see this is the scale of the large scale, and the smaller scales. Well, they are still visible over here, but uh, where they become inhomogeneous. But uh, they are maybe a, a size of a, of a sixth or, or a tenth, that order of magnitude of, uh, of the, the large scale. <clears throat> okay, and I say that all anisotropy uh, information is lost. Just, um, for L smaller L E R. So if they become smaller, they're not all of the, the anisotropy from the large scale is lost. Okay, and with that, um, two informa uh, the, um, the two following processes become important. So first, uh, when the energy the, the, uh, the large-scale structures are going to be breaking up into smaller ones, the energy is transferred to the smaller scales. So that is one of, uh, obviously, one important information. So A, the tra energy transfer. From the larger scales. And call it here tau e i. And then these large scale structures are going to be, well, they're, they're receiving the energy, the, the, the large scale structures are breaking up, they're, they're giving the energy to the smaller scales. The smaller scales then um, uh, breaking it up even smaller until you get to the dissipation. And the dissipation is being done by the viscosity. So for that reason, the, the viscosity is uh, important for these uh, uh, smaller scales as well. So, kinematic viscosity. Okay, so, um, if the energy is going to be transferred to the smaller scales, and the smaller scales are dissipating them. That means the energy is not going to pile up in, in the smaller scales. So it means uh, if you're giving more energy to the, to the smaller scales than it can dissipate, that means the energy would be piling up essentially in the smaller scales. Uh, or if, the other way around, if you're not giving sufficient uh, um, 
energy to the, to the smaller spheres, essentially the smaller spheres would be all dissipated. So if we have an equilibrium that uh, we're giving energy to the smaller scales, and the smaller scales are dissipating it, then you have a local equilibrium. So the, dissip then the dissipation rates, um, uh, and then if you have an equilibrium, essentially the dissipation rate is given by how much energy you receive from the larger scales. <laughs> so the dissipation rate. is determined by the energy transfer rate. Meaning epsilon is approximately one. Yeah. Okay, one more time. Why is that the case? Essentially, if you have an equilibrium, the dissipation you're dissipating at, uh, at the very small scales, that means if the, the, the energy in, in the smaller scales is not going to increase or decrease, that means everything that you need to dissipate at the smaller, smaller scales is going to be having to come from the, from the larger scales. And then that is then determined by All right, and that leads us to the second hypothesis from Kamarov. It's called the uh, first Kamarov's hypothesis on local similarity. In the central sense, and every turbulent flow has sufficiently high Reynolds number. Are we not? So this one we established already. It needs to be a fully turbulent flow. It says that the statistics of the small scale turbulent motions, so the which are below the, the, the inhomogeneity uh, threshold, have a universal form that are uniquely determined by the viscosity nu and the dissipation epsilon. So epsilon, the dissipation rate, goes with the viscosity. And essentially, the viscosity and the dissipation rate are both going to be determining then how much energy is going to be coming from the, from the larger scales. And then you have an equilibrium. <coughs> Okay, so the energy dis the dis dissipation rate is going to be the one that's going to determine what is the um, or is, is the most determining factor inside these smaller scales. Okay, so if that is the case, if the energy or the viscosity and the dissipation rate are the, the most important parts, then we can define some length scales and some time scales with that. So with epsilon and nu, we can define a unique length velocity on time scales. Okay, and uh, these scales are called the Kolmogorov scales. Okay, the length scale, we call it eta, is then defined as mu cube over epsilon to the power one quarter. So there's your length scale. You can then define a velocity scale. So if you put in the, the, the essentially the, the units over here, essentially what, what you get is a, is a length scale. The same way you can now define a velocity scale, you enter. That is going to be epsilon times mu to the power one quarter. And the time scale, tau n, okay, as mu over epsilon to the power one half. 
go to the top Okay, so what can you do with that? So essentially, these uh, the scales are um, characterized as uh, the smallest possible IDs. Smallest possible eddies because you have the Reynolds number of uh, eta, the form to be mu eta times eta over mu, that is equal one in this case. <coughs> so, in this case, that means if you are reducing the size of these uh, eddies. The viscosity will become stronger, will become uh, so strong that it's uh, going to take over. If it's going to be larger than that, that means uh, uh, conductive term here, the u times eta, is going to be larger. So essentially, that is uh, the limit. So, what you can do now, you can especially you can determine now the, the length scale, the Kolmogorov scale, you determine what is a small, the, the size of the smallest eddies in your, in your top end flow. What you need is then um, viscosity. So the viscosity you have that is a um, given constant from, from your from your gas or from your fluid. And uh, you need to have the dissipation rate. And the dissipation rate you can get from if it's in equilibrium from the larger scales, the energy transfer from the from the larger scales. So these are these common raw scales are now going to be the one that are going to limit your spectrum on the uh, on a, the total spectrum on the upper side, because these are the smallest uh, Eddies and the smallest uh, um, uh, yeah, fluctuations that you can find in the uh, network. So, so this limits the spectrum on the other side. Um, And now you can determine the dissipation rate as mu times mu n eta, sorry, over eta square, or as mu times tau eta. Okay. So with that. A very powerful tool now to assess uh, the size of the smallest states.